Brush Fire, a thriller by Matthew Wotecki, published by Liberty Under Attack Publications, narrated by Silas S. Soul, character voices by Silas S. Soul and Miriam Zachariah. Prologue Ed slammed the door to his cream-colored Oldsmobile that sat idle in the parking lot of the apartment complex. He groaned as he tried to crack his neck. It had never been quite right ever since he bent down to fix Mrs. Nelson's plumbing in 218. He was under the sink for a good 45 minutes that day. Ed really worked hard for the people in this building sometimes more than he should have. Other than the frequent repairs and nagging tenants, he was, for the most part, happy with his life. He just wanted to get back up to his apartment and reclaim his lazy boy. All this hustle and commotion with helping Henry and Max escape and evade the police left him feeling exhausted. He hadn't had that much excitement in years, but it was excitement in a good way. It felt like an adventure that had now come to a close. He had a feeling he would never see Henry again and had already started to miss him. He looked back and saw the sun already headed back down in the sky for the day and then he froze. Tall man and his right hand man were back. He saw them in that unforgettable yet ordinary black sedan sitting in the parking lot of the apartment complex. One of the men, the sidekick, looked like he was fiddling with something in the driver's seat, while the other tall fellow looked like he was yelling at him. Ed could see his lips moving and he had an angry look on his face. They hadn't noticed him yet, so he tried not to make any sudden moves. He quickly moved toward the nearby awning by the steps and hid behind the bags of odds and ends he was carrying so they couldn't ID him. It looked like they were too busy playing grab ass with each other to notice. Once Ed hit the concrete awning, he quickly tiptoed up the steps and then ran towards his apartment. Just when he thought the adventure was over, it started up again, but this time he had a bad feeling about it. If Tallman and his sidekick were back, there was probably a good reason for it. The last time, that other guy looked like he wanted to kill someone. Just to do it just because he could get away with it. I told you, B. Barnaby, whatever the fuck your name is. I told you to follow my lead. Why I even brought you on board is beyond me, Tall Man exclaimed, having a shit fit. I'm sorry, boss. I didn't mean it. Anything you need me to do, just tell me, and I'll do it. B looked remorseful, like he was a dog and his master just whacked him with a newspaper. I'm giving you another chance, but I swear to God, one more screw up and I'll drop you off where I found you. Yes, sir. Whatever you need, sir, B said. He couldn't go back to his boring life. With Tall Man, he was something. He was superior and above everyone else. I need you to go do another sweep of the two apartments. Henry's and that old bastard's. Do a thorough check. And do what you have to at Henry's apartment, even if that means turning the place over. You got it? Tall man pulled out a cigarette and let it hang out of his mouth. It wasn't even seconds later that B pulled out his antique Zippo and lit his cigarette for him. Yes, sir. Right away, sir. 
I won't let you down. B spent a few seconds admiring his master. He was so grateful that Tall Man gave him another chance. He was going to do his best and work hard, whatever it took. Now, Tall Man shouted. Yes, yes, sir. B quickly got out of the car, grabbed his cane, and headed towards the complex. B tried to karate kick Henry's apartment door down, but he failed miserably, almost falling down right in view of his master. He didn't want to disappoint him. God damn it! Why can't I do anything right? He tried again and was able to kick hard enough. The shoddy door no match for his size ten and a half Oxfords. It flew open as the steel deadbolt broke through the wooden molding. The place looked the same as the last time they were here a few days ago. Everything seemed untouched, frozen in time. B started rummaging through the unpaid bills, newspapers, and junk mail that had accumulated on Henry's dining room table. It looked like no one sat at the table. It was just a place where he threw shit. B thought that was a shame. He always tried to utilize every space in his house. Even the basement had a purpose. But that's just the type of person B was. He continued rummaging through Henry's garbage while scowling. It was as if he landed on another planet and was looking through a primitive life form's possessions. He felt the sudden urge to raid the fridge for something to drink. Henry still had a leftover tall boy in there. Even though it wasn't B's brand, he quickly popped the top and guzzled it down. There was something refreshing about drinking someone else's beer out of their fridge. B sat down on the couch and took a quick breather. He glanced over at Henry's photos. A trip to Jamaica with a lady friend, a family photo with the glass smashed out of it, and a high school photo of him and his mom. B laughed as he tried to remember his own childhood. Some significant events he could hang pictures up of in his life. But he drew a blank. All he could think of is when the jock kids beat up on him in high school, shoved him in his locker, and called him a freak. He took another sip and left the can half empty on the side table next to the family photo. Then he proceeded to tear everything apart in a fit of rage. Anything it takes, he thought as he ransacked the place. B didn't know what he was looking for at this point, but if he didn't find anything, he wasn't going to leave the apartment undamaged. B paused and looked around. Henry's crap was everywhere. Pieces of broken glass from the picture frames crunched under B's feet. He had caused the maximum amount of violence and destruction and was satisfied for now. He went into Henry's bathroom. It was a small, full bathroom with a bathtub, toilet, and sink, and was standard for most of the apartments in the complex. B put his coat on the ground, emptied all of the items out of his pockets, and climbed into the shower. He turned the spigot to cold and stood under the water. Oh! He screamed like a girl. It's cold! He got water everywhere and his clothes were dripping wet. He got out of the shower and left the water running as he slogged through Henry's apartment. His black leather Oxford shoes squeaked as he looked at the space one more time and gave it a salute before walking out.
one last hurrah for B. He didn't find anything that would even remotely point towards finding Henry. He figured Henry probably never stopped back at his apartment before going on the run. B believed in what they were doing, in the tall man, and in the system. He wanted to be the one to track down Henry so he could make the tall man proud. I'll make you proud, boss. I'll find this guy and make him pay, B thought to himself. If anyone in any of the apartments leading up to the second floor was home or awake, they probably heard the squishing sound of wet clothes and the loud squeaking of damp leather. The squishes and squeaks came up the stairs to the second floor of the complex. B knew precisely where to go next. That old bastard's apartment. He took it slow, like a psycho savoring his kill. Every few seconds, he tapped his antique cane against the ground. A few of the older residents looked through their peepholes and saw a wet, middle-aged man with thinning black hair and a trench coat advancing slowly down the hallway, making an old, matted gray carpet even worse. As he got closer to Ed's apartment, B started yelling. Come out, you old bastard! His tin police badge hung proudly over his belt loop and dug into his overweight gut. What the living hell is going on out there? Ed sprung up from his lazy boy and grabbed his robe to cover up his boxers, a pair of old tube socks, and a pit-stained off-white t-shirt. Come out of that box, you old bastard! B kept yelling. He began knocking on Ed's door with the silver metal eagle part of his antique cane the top part that B sometimes leaned on. Not because he had a back or leg problem, but out of sheer laziness. Okay, you better be ready for a fight, whoever that is. Rent ain't due for another week. Go back to your apartment, Ed yelled as he grabbed an old Louisville slugger from the compact coat closet. I'm not here for the rent. You old bastard, B whispered, leaning against Ed's door. The water trailed down the hall, stopping at a giant puddle. B paced in front of the door. Ed looked through the peephole and saw B standing there. You again? I told you cops all I know. Please just go away. B began lunging himself against a wooden door. These doors were old and thin and were not going to withstand someone putting their full weight on them. Within two or three of B's full-bodied assaults, the door came flying open to reveal the old bastard armed with a Louisville slugger. Ed took a full swing. The last time he opened up with this bat was on the high school baseball team. For a second, it felt good. Get the hell out of here, you asshole! Get! Ed managed to hit B square in the pelvis, and he lunged over in pain. He just stood there in a puddle of water grabbing himself. No, I don't want any more trouble. I know you're a cop and whatnot. But if you try to press charges, I'll call your supervisor and tell him what you did to my door. And why the hell are you all wet? B picked up his black antique wooden cane and then lunged at Ed like he was attempting to sack a quarterback, knocking him back into the apartment. The wooden door was now only held up by one hinge. He started wailing on Ed's face with his leather glove fist. That'll show you, you old bastard. Where's Henry? He kept shouting. Ed was on the ground, taking B's blows. I, I don't know. 
Stop eating me! Oh! Ed screamed in pain. B leaned down over his victim. His wet, thinning black hair fell into Ed's face, and he whispered into his right ear. You don't tell me where he is. I'm gonna kill you. You hear me? Old man. Mister, I don't know. I swear. I told you all I knew before. Ed just laid there and was relieved B's beating paused for a moment. B took the eagle part of his cane and whacked it into Ed's torso like a sledgehammer. Ed started crying, and then all of a sudden he grabbed his chest and started wheezing. It looked like he had a heart attack. Call! What, old man? Call 911! He said as he continued grabbing his chest. No, I'm not going to call anyone, you bastard. Why would I? Ed slowly tried to step towards the old rotary phone on the wall. Eh, 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 B said, and he whacked Ed's hand with his cane. Ed fell over and started gasping for air and fell down onto his lazy boy. His robe came untied, and B watched him die in his boxers and tube socks. Well, that's done, he said, now talking to himself. He pulled Ed's robe closed with his cane, but wasn't showing any decency or civility. B was just sick of seeing the old man's flab and hairy body. It was disgusting. He stood there over Ed, scoffing. He couldn't tell us what we wanted to know, so he had to go. The old man's lifeless body just sat there in his lazy boy and looked back at B with a cold, blank stare. B was anxious to go back to the car and report back to his master about all he had done. End of Prologue Chapter 1 Three Months Ago To Henry Tucker, life was just a series of failures organized neatly into days. Today was merely less of a failure than usual. Just a typical Sunday. Football and church for most folks in Ohio. Henry picked up one end of the old, heavy, antique cabinet someone brought in a few minutes ago. On the other end of the monstrous beast was Wayne, the trustworthy and loyal supervisor of the I-77 Antique Mall. The town of Ravenna, Ohio had been built around I-77 Antiques. It was there even before the hustle and bustle of the working crowd that eventually settled down there. The antique mall's position, when compared to I-77, indicated that at some point the state had made an effort to buy the place. But it was refused, so they just built around it. The mall had been there far longer than the road itself, and at least half of the inhabitants of Ravenna. The other half were elderly and could remember when he used to walk into the mall and buy soda pop for a dime and walk out with a truckload of stuff for the money you had in your wallet. For the most part, customers of the I-77 mall were working class folks in a town where everyone knew everyone else. People settled down there to have the American dream, and when they died, most of the stuff they accumulated found its way into the I-77 mall. Wayne Williams' wrinkled, sweaty palms slipped as he yelled something or other at Henry. Henry? 
Pay attention. I am, Wayne. Where are we going with this thing? Henry snapped back, almost dropping the giant monstrosity that felt like it was a million pounds. This had been the most significant item they had accepted in a while. Somebody probably needed the money. A woman in her fifties with blonde hair and gray streaks adjusted her perm. Now matted after running through the snow from her car, spotted the dark mahogany chest as it slowly crept down the aisles. The hardware clanged melodically as it moved, and there was an occasional grunt that came from either Wayne or Henry as they tried to keep it steady. She looked thoughtfully at it, then changed her mind and moved on to the next aisle. I don't want to buy this guitar here if it ain't going to play gospel. That's what I mostly listen to, and country. She continued talking to the stranger in the aisle next to her by a set of old guitars. Not the ones that once played that violent, sinful filth, but the kind of guitar your grandpa might have played at church. Well, this one here just needs a bit of tuning, but I guarantee you can get that twang you're looking for, and it'll play good gospel, the older gentleman replied. In the back of his head, he wondered why this lady thought he worked there, but she looked like a nice old lady, so he played along anyway. He knew a little something about guitars, but wasn't an expert. This wasn't the first time someone mistook him for someone that worked there. He just had that, I know what I'm doing, kind of look on his face. The tune kept playing over the loudspeaker while customers shopped. 77, Sunset Strip. 77, 77, 77. Mr. I Know What I'm Doing sung along to the theme song of the popular 50s TV series, 77 Sunset Strip. There was another estate sale today. Some poor guy cashed in, and they needed to get rid of his things. That's what they called it when someone died, and the family brought all their stuff in they had accumulated over a lifetime just to get rid of it. A couple of dressers, beds, old lamps, you name it. It was one of the larger cash-ins they saw in years. Henry wondered what his cash-in would look like when the time came. This thought reverberated through his head as he ran up to the front to see what the hell Wayne wanted. He didn't have much, just some old junk at his apartment. He imagined his things and how Wayne would set them out on display, all of his trinkets thrown into a booth like yesterday's trash. People would walk by and stare in horror at his busted-up old recliner. He could see them snub their noses at his fake leather couch he purchased at one of those same as cash no money down deals. Henry, I'm gonna need to know where we wanna go with this. Wayne pointed at the rest of the furniture strewn up near the front desk. Do you think we'll get off early today, Wayne? Henry wiped the dust off his hands on his overalls, looking back at the dresser they just positioned into booth number 57. Henry could see a woman's arm holding up a guitar. The twangy kind. He helped carry the item to the front desk and then stopped at one of the booths that contained mostly old farm equipment. It looked like his Uncle John had loaded up the contents of his garage and dumped them off. He looked at the old rusted gears, oil cans, and mechanical equipment that were strewn about. 
he tried to gather some sense of organization out of it all. That was part of his job. To organize things so they would sell. It wasn't just old farm equipment. Each booth was a stage, and each item told a story. He caught the faint whiff of old tobacco on the items. It reminded him of when he was a kid and everyone smoked inside instead of freezing out in the cold just to catch a fix. The tune on the overhead speaker re-looped. 77, Sunset Strip. 77, Sunset Strip. <laughs> Seventy-seven. Seventy-seven. Henry hummed as he looked at the old junk. It wasn't junk to him. You coming or what? Wayne appeared out of nowhere and looked at him like he was talking to his kid. I ain't supposed to be buying. I'm supposed to be selling, Henry said putting down the old antique oil can next to a 1958 edition of Look magazine. He didn't know whether he was trying to convince himself or Wayne. And another cool cat bit the dust, he thought to himself. He wasn't sure where that line was from, but he remembered his good old dad sitting in front of the box tube TV after work. <laughs> Seventy-seven, hmm, 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 seventy-seven, sunset. He caught up to Wayne, and they walked the rest of the aisle together. End of chapter one.